you know, how, how much have you searched around um, this, this space? Uh, have you looked for other factors upstream or downstream? You know, how do you know that the one that you settled on is actually a good one? And so in this case, we looked at um, four other proteins and we looked at the combination of those proteins all together. And, um, and you know, when I look at this data, uh, I have to say that I think, um, I think we might have been a little lucky with the one that we picked. Um, so, so this is RT-PCR analysis um, in cells looking at, um, at the, uh, at SNRF, SNRP and expression. And we're just looking to see if our factor is repressing the expression at, at that promoter. And, and this is in uh, Neuro 2A cells. And so if we just put in the factors with no crab domain, we see, uh, let's say, some kind of a baseline of expression at that promoter. And then uh, this is our S100 protein, which is the one that we uh, had settled on at first. And you can see that it's very much repressing transcription at that promoter. And here's uh, four other zinc fingers that we made in that area. And none of them are repressing. In fact, uh, some of them look like they're kind of activating. And then when we put the combinations together, they're like activating even more. So go figure on that one. But um, I was very happy that uh, this guy seems to be wor working really well. Um, and it's also nice that it expresses well too. So uh, hopefully we can stay like that. Um, now, uh, back when I was a postdoc a long, 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 long time ago, um, if you could just show activation of this gene in a cell, you know, that could be a really interesting study. Today, not so much, because, you know, we need to think about how we could not just do this in cell culture, but how we could actually apply this as a therapy. And so, um, we needed a way to deliver this protein into the brain, and, you know, we thought about um, several different approaches, viral vectors and whatnot. Um, but the one that we uh, um, ended up moving forward with was to use the cell penetrating peptide, uh, which is, um, uh, this is actually the uh, TAT peptide from HIV. And all cell penetrating peptides supposedly endow their cargo with the ability to cross membranes, and including the membranes of the blood brain barrier, that endothelial barrier. And so what the hope was when we started was that just by putting this little peptide onto this, uh, in this large protein, that that would help us to uh, get it into cells and, um, and maybe cross the blood-brain barrier and everything. But that was kind of a hope when we were just starting. We were able to track that somewhat because we also attached this um, M-cherry, which is a red fluorescent protein. And, uh, and that came in handy for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, it allowed the guys that make the protein in the lab to track it easily. So we grow the, uh, we're going to make purified protein, and that's what we're going to inject. And we grow it up uh, in bacteria in the lab, and then we purify it. So this is just the pellet, and you can see that the pellet is bright red, and then this is the purified protein. So we inject this red stuff into the mice, and it's red because of the M. cherry. It also allows us to do fluorescence studies, so we could track the protein. We can actually uh, track it uh, in live animals um, with um, <clears throat> in vivo uh, fluorescence imaging devices that we have uh, at UC Davis. And uh, so these are pictures of, of three mice that um, have their heads shaved, and they were treated with our uh, therapeutic protein that we call S1, or uh, a sham protein that is uh, exactly the same kind of protein, but it has 26 amino acid changes in the DNA binding portion. So it should be, you know, the same protein, but it's not binding to that site. Actually, it's not binding to any known site in mouse. So we were hoping it's not binding anywhere. It might be binding somewhere. Uh, and when we put these proteins in, uh, we can see fluorescence in the cranium of the mice. Um, there's a little bit of background signal in the mock, just some background fluorescence, but I hope you can see that there's uh, some pretty intense fluorescence with either one of these proteins in the, in the heads of the mice. Um, now, of course, this isn't saying that it's getting in the cells. Uh, it's not even saying it crossed the blood-brain barrier, but it is saying it's getting up there. So uh, we, it allowed us to do some kinetics, and we could see that when we injected it, um, we saw a peak of fluorescence 
in, uh, in the brain region um, kind of on a four to eight hour uh, time frame. And uh, by 24 hours, the signal had essentially gone back down to background levels. I can tell you, I'm not showing it here, but I can tell you that most of the signal ended up in the kidney and then they peed and it was all gone. So uh, we calculated that we have about a 16 hour half-life of the protein, I think. Um, and so that kind of uh, gave us guidance on how to start doing treatment studies. You know, we thought we'd probably have to inject it periodically to make sure that there was sufficient protein there kind of throughout a treatment period. Um, this is uh, looking at the protein distribution when we injected it into mice. Um, and uh, here we're, uh, even though it's red, we're not using the fluorescent protein, but we're using the HA tag that's attached to the protein, so another way of tracking it. And this is just to show that it really distributed throughout the, the brain. Um, which was another thing that I don't know if we could have predicted when we started this, but it was really nice uh, that we were able to see that it really had very widespread distribution throughout the brain. And I think that's in contrast to um, the, at least the viral vector data that I had at the time, where um, uh, oftentimes the um, distribution of uh, viral vectors in the brain were uh, fairly close to the site of injection. So we were really happy to see this kind of brain-wide distribution. And then, you know, then the question was, well, you know, this is still not really saying if it's getting into cells and getting into the nucleus, so we were trying to think how we could test that. And then we said, well, why don't we just do the, the experiment that we all want to know? Does it turn on UB3A? Because if it does that, I guess it's getting in. And so, um, so here um, we're showing uh, Hippocampus and cerebellum slices from treated animals. These animals were treated for four weeks, three injections per week. And um, uh, we had wild type mice as controls. So the green is the UB3A signal. Obviously, it's the DAPI signal to looking at nuclei. So we're looking at hippocampus and cerebellum. These are the AS mice, so either very weak signal or no signal in them. When we treat these mice with the sham protein, we don't see a big change in fluorescence, but when we treat it with the therapeutic protein, we see a fairly substantial increase in UB3A, and we can quantitate that, and it's significant. We could also look on a Western, and we see uh, at least uh, some isoforms of UB3A coming up on Western as well. So it took our lab a long time uh, to do this again and again and again till I was convinced that this was really something that was working, and it was working on a Monday, and it was also working on a Wednesday. But now I'm pretty convinced that this is actually working. So, um, so it looks like we could turn that on. This is, this is another, um, this was a subcutaneous injection, actually. And uh, in this experiment, it's just another experiment, um, this was a uh, inter, uh, interperitoneal injection, and um, here I'm just showing kind of a zoomed in um, image of uh, in hippocampus and cerebellum, but it's the same kind of story. These are the Angelman syndrome mice with the sham protein. You don't see much of an increase, but with S1 protein, you see a, a fairly large increase. And again, we can quantitate that. And then I, I would just want to say one more thing. This is a different antibody than the antibody that, that was used to detect UB3A in the earlier picture. So we tried to cover a lot of different uh, potential uh, confounding factors, and so I think that this is really what's happening. So I think what our study showed is that we were able to uh, design an artificial transcription factor that could be injected IP or SC, it could cross the blood-brain barrier, it could enter neurons throughout the brain and uh, ap activate the epigenetically silenced uh, paternal allele in the mouse brain, um, and the sham protein did not activate that. So. Uh, it did not seem to be due to the fact that, you know, overexpression of the crab domain or you know, just some kind of effect of having injected the protein. It seems to be related to the specific DNA binding activity of that protein. So what's next for this? What are the remaining uh, challenges? Um, we've shown them, I feel like we've shown a molecular rescue uh, of UB3A expression. That's only uh, the beginning of the story. We really need to know what it's doing to the mice and is it rescuing phenotypes in the mice. So um, we're working on that now and uh, FAST, uh, the Foundation for Injury Syndrome Therapeutics has a consortium of scientists that uh, collaborate very closely together called the FIRE team. And we have uh, um, 
all the members of the fire team kind of coming together on, on, on trying to help us with this, particularly Ann Anderson and Ed Weber. Um, and we're, we're looking at that in mice, and you know, the first step is to just do the same study that we did in the mice where we saw the molecular rescue, same dose and everything, and see you know, how that affects phenotypes. Um, I'm not a big fan of the mouse model. Um, I, I, it's really uh, been an invaluable resource and, and you know, showed us a lot of things, and we've learned a lot of things on that. Um, we have made a, uh, the consortium has made a, a rat model as well that has a full deletion of UB3A. That's in the process of being characterized, so we don't know that much about it yet. Um, but um, we're hoping that that might give us some better insights, but that remains to be seen. But right now we're doing this in, in mouse where, you know, we have a good baseline for comparison. Um, and some of the other things that we're doing, you know, we want to test off-target effects and immune responses. Um, at this point, since we're working with a protein that's built to recognize the mouse sequence, if we were to eventually think about taking this into human, we would have to redesign the protein to a human sequence anyway. So I don't want to overemphasize off-targeting of this particular protein, but we do need to know if the effects that we're seeing are direct or indirect, and I'm pretty sure they're direct, but we need to look at that more carefully. Um, we also have to look at the immune response but, uh, more carefully, but I could say that over the four-week treatment period that we gave them, we didn't see any overt toxicity, meaning we didn't see like obvious signs of inflammation upon necropsy. We didn't see the mice uh, change behaviors or anything like that. So uh, that was with the zinc finger protein. Um, and then uh, we're also wanting to evaluate alternative delivery methods or alternative methods to increase persistence and delivery. So, um, although uh, certainly we could point to a lot of um, protein-based therapies where people have to do frequent injections, most notably being like insulin uh, therapy for diabetics where they have to take multiple injections. Um, I don't know if it would be um, something that would stop us from trying to move forward with this and, and if, if, if all we had was this injectable biologic but uh, certainly something that would have increased persistence would probably be better if we didn't have to treat people uh, three times a week. Um, so we have you know, several ideas about how to approach increasing persistence, so that's a kind of uh, exciting area for me in this, uh, with this project. And also delivery, so right now, again, it, this strategy is an injectable biologic that may not be the best way to introduce this factor into the mice. And so we're looking at uh, quite a number of different approaches there, uh, and, and there's many approaches that we could try. But the fact that there's many different ways to deliver things into the brain often indicates that there's no one good way to deliver things into the brain. So probably you know, we have to find a method that is gonna be the best method for what we're trying to do, and we're certainly looking at, at several. But I just wanna talk about uh, one of these, um, which is a, a recent grant that we uh, were given by this um, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. So that's a body in California that funds stem cell research. And uh, they really uh, try to emphasize the translational use of stem cells is really uh, their big push. And so, um, so we were awarded a, a, a grant recently uh, in a collaboration that involves um, Jan Nolta, who's the director of the UC Davis uh, Stem Cell Center. And, and our own Jill Silverman um, uh, at UC Davis, our star at UC Davis in the Rodent Behavioral Core. And so um, the plan there is to introduce our factor into a lentivirus and put that into the mesenchymal stem cells. Now these mesenchymal stem cells is something that uh, Jan Nolta uses a lot and um, they uh, have a lot of very interesting properties. So, you know, the, the big picture is that we want to express, have the protein expressed in these cells and then introduce those cells into the brain. And the cells would then secrete the protein and they could be taken up in just the same way that our injected protein is taken up. So, one of the benefits of working with a biologic as opposed to a drug is that our bodies can make a biologic. And so, we should take advantage of that uh, in delivery, you know, if we could take advantage of that. Um, so we would have the cells make the protein. If we put it in the brain, it's just being made in the brain. We don't have to worry about systemic delivery. Um, the mesenchymal stem cells are well known to have some kind of uh, immunomodulatory effect that uh, even if they come from a different person, you could put them into anybody's body and they somehow 
like uh, down modulate the immune response. So, uh, so that should be a plus and, uh, and should be a plus um, for delivery of these to the neurons in case we need to worry about immune responses in the future. So I think this approach has a lot of positive aspects to it. Um, and I'm very happy that CIRM was able to give us a chance to try to pursue it. So I'm just going to close there and thank uh, some of the um, most important people that have done this research. So uh, some of you may know Barbara Bayless when she was uh, talking here years ago um, at the ASF conference. She's now moved on to, to be a postdoc at the um, Buck Institute for Aging, um, but she's still actually pretty linked in with the Angelman community. So I guess once Angelman gets, you know, gets in your system, it's just, uh, you, know, you get hooked in. Um, ben Piles uh, allows us to do everything with mice, so he's been really instrumental all, all along, and now Henio Jean um, in my lab is uh, doing a lot of this work as well. And we have to thank um, Angelman Syndrome Foundation, which gave us our start in this project um, that led to uh, funding through the NIH, and uh, especially FAST um, has really funded this work um, and, uh, and I just want to thank them for, you know, all the, the support that they've given us and the, the inspiration, really. I would thank them for the inspiration, uh, for being part of that team and, um, and really um, um, giving us a, a wonderful opportunity to, to do this work. And now I'm just going to show this next slide and I'll take questions during this slide. But this is, um, these are mesenchymal stem cells that have been uh, transduced with the lentiviral vector, so they're glowing red here. And, um, and I'll show this little movie. So just imagine, um, just imagine these, these uh, cells that are expressing our, our transcription factor migrating around in the brain, going around trying to find those neurons and making the protein. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, so, so are you asking why, why we use the repression transcription factor to activate UB3A? Uh, like, so the, the right. So you're wondering why those other ones that we're, that we're not going to use are showing some activation. Um, no, I can't answer that. Not really. Um, you know, some, some people have published papers saying that they see activation when they use a crab domain, and so in some way that I don't, know, think, I don't think anyone understands, in some context it acts, uh, acts as an activator. Um, I don't think anyone knows any kind of mechanism for that. Generally, when it's there, it's always a repression domain. Right, so the question is, did we try this with Cas9 and it absolutely works with the crab domain, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've looked a lot with uh, CRISPR-Cas. It's a great way to kind of pilot things. Um, and if we have an alternative delivery method, we might use that for delivery of, of Cas9. Um, but with this injectable approach, it didn't seem like Cas9 was something that, CRISPR-Cas was something we could use. All right, thanks.